Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com, and this is episode 28 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. Now, today I want to do something quite a bit different from all the other shows that we've done, and that's answer your questions from Facebook on a video. I reached out to you guys on Facebook and said, hey, post your questions, automotive related or otherwise, and I'll burn through them in a video and answer as many as I possibly can. So... I'm going to do that. I got my iPad right here. I'm going to just roll down the list and answer as many of these questions as I possibly can. Um, I would love to know what you guys think of this show. Go ahead and post your thoughts in the comments section. If this works well and you guys really dig it, maybe we can make this a more regular thing. But, uh, you know, I like answering your questions on video. It, um, it lets me know what you guys are interested in. It sort of pushes me a little bit to, to talk about some stuff that maybe isn't 100% in my comfort zone, but, uh, you know, it helps me learn and get better and, uh, you know, answers the questions you guys have. So with that, let's get rolling. First question is from Ed. Ed says he would like to hear my opinion on the DSG considering performance, reliability, and cost of maintenance. Uh, looks like Ed's having some knee issues, so a manual transmission isn't really an option for him anymore. And considering maintenance cost, you know, a DSG fluid replacement every 40000 um, is not a cheap service. I think ours comes in at 325, 350, something like that. Um, I love the DSG transmission. I think it's a blast to drive. Uh, I think that they're doing some really cool things with software tuning. Um, yes, it's expensive. Uh, there are, you know, the ma again, the maintenance cost is, is a, is high. Uh, especially when you pair that in a diesel, you know, the intervals sort of line up in a, maybe in a bad way, uh, as far as spending money on maintenance goes. But, you know, it can hold the horsepower. Um, it can, it can shift as fast or faster than anybody can actually shift a manual transmission. So I think it's there. And, um, you know, I'd love to really get into sort of experiencing what a tuned DSG drives like. Um, so Ed, I think that's a good, a good alternative, you know, I would, if we're talking about performance, you know, for most people, a manual transmission is the best route to go. Um, I would take a DSG way over a regular automatic or what a lot of people call a slush box. Um, manual transmissions, I think, again, is, is the best option for a lot of people, but I love the DSG. Yes, it can get expensive, but, you know, we have to weigh the driving factor fun wise performance wise versus that extra cost of you know 350 bucks every 40,000 miles you know when we when we extrapolate that all out across the uh, the mileage interval it's not a ton of money it just kind of hurts the wallet when uh, when that one comes up plus there's a really great video that I did with Deutsch Auto Parts on a DIY uh, you can save a little bit doing it yourself and uh, you know sort of reduce the cost that way so I think it's a good option. I think we're only going to see better DSG software come through. Uh, the one negative I've experienced personally, and this was on an older GTI, um, probably a 9 or a 10 GTI, is they're a little finicky in stop and go traffic. It becomes a little bit jerky. Um, sort of like someone that's not a really good manual transmission driver would uh, would feel like in uh, in heavy stop and go. So that's one thing to consider um, when you guys are test driving one, you know, on a, on a car you're looking to buy. I would try and try and uh, replicate some stop and go traffic and, and sort of get the experience for that. But uh, and you can add paddle shifters, which is really cool. So Ed, uh, I think it's a good option, and uh, I would I would definitely go for it. Next we have Kip. Can I run biodiesel in my 2011 Jetta Sportwagon TDI? If so, do I need to do anything to prep it? All right, Kip, that's a great question. Officially, you can run B5, which is 5% biodiesel. That comes from Volkswagen. Um, that's my official answer and the only answer I'm going to officially give. Now, I'm not going to just leave you hanging like that. There are a ton of people running biodiesel in their common rail TDIs. Um, there has been issues with high pressure fuel pumps. I don't know that there any of them have been attributed to running biodiesel specifically. Uh, I've seen them fail with regular diesel. I've seen them fail with gasoline. I've seen them fail with gasoline diesel mix. And I would go out on a limb and say there's probably been a few that have failed with biodiesel. Um, I, since I know actually where Kip's from, um, you know, temperature does play a factor. Generally, biodiesel tends to gel at a warmer temperature than 
uh, you know, traditional diesel wood. I don't think that's anything you need to really worry about. Um, I might, if I were going to do it, Kip, I would probably do a little bit at a time and sort of see, see where it landed me. Um, you can also re do some research on like TDI Club. Um, there's a lot of smart guys on there. It's just like any forum though, you got to kind of weed through the BS in order to get the really good information. But, um, you know, biodiesel should have all the same lubricating properties as traditional diesel should. Um, we, again, we've experienced fuel system failures at, at every rate, so uh, I don't think we can attribute fuel system failure specifically to biodiesel. It's just something you want to be, be careful of and be aware of. But again, officially, B5 is what your, uh, your sport wagon can handle. Next up, we have Jeremy. Thoughts on letting techs borrow tools? Uh, and there's actually a reply to that. Um, James said nothing wrong with letting people borrow tools. Uh, you know, I agree with that. I loan out my tools all the time. Um, for the most part, I trust everybody in my shop. I'm not worried about anybody stealing anything. Most of the tools that I buy, if they get broken, um, are under warranty. That's one of the main reasons why I buy them that way. Uh, there does come a point where it gets really, really old. Um, I've had guys borrow the same tool five, six, seven times, and when it gets to that point, it gets ridiculous, and um, I tend to, uh, you know, throttle back on that a little bit. But, you know, the one thing that you got to remember is that if you work in a shop, you guys are really all on the same team. There may be a time where you need to borrow something from somebody else, and, uh, you know, being a jerk about letting somebody borrow tools can come back to bite you. And, you know, it's, it's not just a tool share, it's information share. And, you know, having other techs in your shop that you're, you're friendly with and get along with really well is, is a benefit to everybody. So for the most part, I say let them borrow the tool. If it gets out of control, you know, uh, <laughs> just let them know that it's time for them to buy that. Um, if it's something ridiculous that, you know, every technician should have, I say it's all right to razz them a little bit. And then when it just gets out of control, uh, I like to charge guys a dollar to, uh, to borrow stuff. And, you know, it's not really any value, but it lets me get a candy bar out of the snack machine. So, uh, plus it makes them think twice about coming to ask you to borrow tools and, and, you know, lets them know that, hey, you got to spend the money to do the job just like I did. So if you're in a shop, a good shop with a bunch of good guys, let them do it. Um, if you work on a team system like I do, pretty much on my team, if you need to borrow a tool, borrow the tool. When it gets outside of my team is where, uh, you know, I might have to razz a guy a little bit to, uh, to let him borrow my stuff. But uh, I say go for it. It's not a big deal. All right, we got Drew. Drew says, why does the 2.0T FSI burn so much oil? How much of a real problem is it to have an engine burning that much oil in terms of reliability and engine life? One quart per thousand miles. Well, Drew, that's a great question. Um, officially, one quart per thousand miles is a normal uh, condition on that FSI, uh, according to Volkswagen. Now, it feels like a lot of oil, especially when you realize that these service intervals are every 10,000 miles, which we have another question on coming up, so I won't dive too much into that. Um, there's a couple things on the FSI that are a problem. Uh, one is the crank vent system has traditionally been weak. Uh, they've updated the crank vent valve one or two times. Um, they've changed a crank vent pipe that comes off the valve cover at least once, maybe twice. Those were on, uh, I think, required vehicle update. So Volkswagen knows that it's an issue. They've replaced a few things and updated a few things to try and get it to be less of an issue. Uh, we've also had a number of piston rings that wear, and that'll cause a lot of oil consumption. I know the Audi A4s seem to be worse about it than the Volkswagen side. Uh, it seems to be something to do with the mounting of the engine, you know, transverse versus longitudinal. The longitudinal engines seem to have a lot more issues with um, oil consumption through the piston rings. I know our Audi store does way more rings than we do at the Volkswagen store, but uh, they, they still do them as well. So, um, you know, it, it is a problem. It's a problem for engine life because a lot of people don't check their oil. So even if you're on 5,000 mile interval and you're burning a quart every thousand miles, well, you're burning every quart of oil in the engine by the time you're due for an oil change. 
a lot of times the check engine light comes on before that happens or you run into an issue where it's really, really loud um, or both. So usually it doesn't get that bad, but you know, anytime your engine's deprived of oil, it, it raises the temperature, it increases wear, and uh, you know, that's, that's all bad. <laughs> bad, bad, bad things for an engine. So um, there's a couple design issues. You know, turbocharged cars, I think, traditionally do use more oil than non-turbocharged cars. But it is a problem, and it's one reason why you need to make sure, regardless of length on service interval, that um, that we're all checking our engine oil and uh, you know other fluids as well with that. So good question though. Nope, oh, it was the next question. <laughs> Do I agree with the Volkswagen 10,000 mile oil change um, interval? Yes and no. The oil itself 100% lasts 10,000 miles. Um, no problem. We're using full synthetic oils. Um, it, it's not a problem at all, even on the turbocharged engines on the TSI, the FSI. 10,000 miles purely from an oil standpoint is fine. Where I don't think it's okay is that for the most part people aren't checking their oil. So like you know like Drew asked about the uh, about using oil, we're not checking our oil so now instead of not having anything checked on our car every 5,000 now we're going twice that long and you know it's it's beyond just oil really it's tires it's brakes, um, you know, it's all these little maintenance things that, yeah, last 10,000 miles, no problem, but, you know, the way I like to explain it to people is, if you have an interval that's 10,000 miles, that means no one's doing an inspection on your car for 10,000 miles. 10,000 miles can be the difference between, you know, putting brake pads on a car because the pads are worn, or having to put pads and rotors on a car because you've dug into the rotor and um, you know, cut a really big groove to the point where you can't resurface the rotor. Uh, now you spent double on a brake job of what you really would have if, if maybe that would have been a 5,000 mile interval. Also, CV boots. You know, if if a CV boot splits and it goes 5,000 miles, eh, odds are we can salvage it and we can just put a boot on it and uh, and let you on the road. If it goes 10,000 miles, that might not be the case. You know, we might be looking at replacing an axle because now you have some popping when you turn. So um, if you're going to go the 10,000 miles, then it sort of falls on the driver to make sure they're doing these checks. They're inspecting their tires. They're checking their brakes. They're checking their oil. They're checking their wiper blades. I had a gal come in one time with her wiper blades were so worn that the blade, you know, if, if this is your wiper blade laying on the windshield and you flip it up, the blade that touches the windshield was completely gone. Well, the piece that holds the wiper arm um, to the blade had actually cut into the windshield. So as it was scraping the windshield, it was literally scraping the windshield. And, uh, you know, the only fix for that, because it had actually worn into the windshield, was to replace the windshield. So, um, 10,000 miles, again, the oil can hold up. It's not a problem. It's really like sort of the rest of the stuff that, uh, that I really get concerned about. And, you know, the problem too is that if the service interval is 5,000 miles, you might be great at getting your oil changed every 5,000 miles, but a lot of people aren't. So they'll push it to 6,000 miles. Well, now if we're at 10, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to push it to 11. We're going to push it to 11.5. So now we're stretching that even further out. And, um, you know, an oil change is 50 to $75 for a full synthetic oil change. It's one more time. You know, it's one more time a year, say. Uh, I think that's a really good investment on the longevity of your vehicle and potentially saving you money on things like brakes, things like CV boots, you know, wear and tear items that a technician would be able to catch and, uh, and maybe save you some money doing it every 5000 versus doing it at 10000 <laughs> All right, Darren asks, do I want to buy a Mark II Jetta Coupe with an ABA engine swap? Um, maybe, I don't know. I actually messaged, uh, messaged Darren about that. Uh, I think Jetta Coupes are really cool, so uh, I might be into that, but uh, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on that. That's a cool swap, so uh, Darren, we might, we might be in touch. All right, Matthew asks, as a Service Express technician coming into the main service and repair field at a dealership, what's my best advice in general for becoming a great technician? Um, 
You know, I've done a couple shows on this, Matthew, and I know I know you've been following for a long time. Matthew's actually a, uh, a buddy of mine. Um, man, you got to work hard every day. You know, you got to learn every day. You have to make sure that you're taking your time and doing the job right, as well as doing the job quick. Um, don't ever sit around on the computer and screw off all day. Uh, and which I know he's not, and I'm not yelling at him. But this is just again in advice in general. Um, make sure that if you have downtime, you're either you know on VW Hub studying SSPs, doing web-based training, working with other technicians in the shop to uh, to learn the the ins and outs of the business. Make sure your documentation is top-notch. Stories, um, diagnostic processes, all that stuff needs to be completely dialed in. Um, because the better you are at that, the more you're going to get paid. And, uh, you know, I use pay a lot and I think a lot of people kind of frown on that, but guys, that's the name of the game. That's why we're all in the shop is to make a paycheck. So the more you can do to fine tune what you do in the shop, the more you're going to make, the more customers you're going to earn and, uh, you know, the better of a technician you're going to become. So, uh, I don't know if we've done an entire show completely on that subject, Matthew, but I think that's some that, uh, that we're definitely going to do, and uh, it's a great topic, and, and it's you know not just for you Service Express guys. It's for anybody that's trying to get in the field, or anybody that's in the field. You know, sitting back and thinking, "Man, I'm a really good technician," and doing nothing about it is a good way to uh, to let all those other techs in the shop pass you by. So um, just keep working hard, man. I know you've been busting your butt this last year, doing a really good job. So keep doing that. Um, we'll keep doing shows about how to be better technicians and some things we can do to fine tune our game. Make sure you're talking to customers and getting to know them. And, uh, you know, being a technician on a brand that you really care about can lead to being burned out on the brand. So, um, you know, for you specifically, Matthew, don't lose that passion you got for the brand, dude. Um, it's rare and, uh, and I love it. And, um, uh, I like to see that uh, there's other guys out there that, that love the brand like I do and some other of my fellow techs do. So keep it up, dude. You're doing a great job. Jacob asks, what do I like about the Mark 7 so far and what do I dislike about the Mark 7 so far from the service and repair perspective? Um, you know, I haven't really done a lot of service on them. I will say I'm not in love with that composite, uh, composite oil pan. <sighs> We'll see what happens long term. You know, over my career, I've had a lot of things that I thought would be great and turned out to be terrible, and a lot of things that were terrible that I thought were terrible that turned out to be just fine. So we'll see how that works out long term. That's kind of the one that really stands out in my mind. Um, this new generation of engine, the EA888, uh, the variable valve thing is weird, and I'm concerned how that's going to perform long term, especially on a 10K. Um, oil change service, but the truth is, Jacob, it's they're just too new to know. Um, I will say, if we move away from the GTI and focus on the Golf, I don't like where the oil filter is on the new TDIs. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's nitpicky technician stuff. The new two liter and the Golfs are very very crammed. Um, we've added urea injection, which I'm okay with. It's just one more thing to do on a service. Um, Outside of the service and repair, man, I love the damn cars. They're great. The GTIs are a blast to drive. Uh, you know, one car of the year, I think it's a very appealing looking car. Um, I kind of want one really bad. Uh, so, you know, I love the Mark 7. The only thing I don't like about the GTI is um, in the cockpit, seems very busy. There's a lot of buttons on, you know, on the steering wheel. The center console's got a lot going on. The instrument panel's got a lot going on. So I don't love that, but that's pretty much how cars are now. You know, I get in my Passat, which is an 05, and it's very plain, not a whole lot going on. And then I get in some of these new cars, and it's just busy, busy, busy to me. So uh, not a bad thing, just, you know, a, a personal thing and, and uh, really the way, the way of the future. So nothing I'm going to be able to do about that. But I like the car a lot. I think it's going to be a good car for us. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had one with issues, but uh, we're working that out. Some axle issues that I might talk about next week or something. Because uh, I'm not sold on the idea that I got it fixed yet. But anyway, it's a great car. I love it. I think it's going to be, uh, be one of uh, our best sellers and hopefully a really good launch for us. 
All right, Christian asks, why VW slash Audi, not as just a profession, but as an enthusiast? Well, I'll tell you why as a profession. Um, when I was going to UTI, they have manufacturer's programs, and it was BMW, Audi, uh, Volkswagen, Mercedes, Porsche, and there might have been one or two more at the time. I don't really remember. I know they have a ton more now, but I chose Volkswagen specifically because there were more Volkswagens on the road than, than the rest of the car lines, so um, that was an easy choice for me. And, you know, I, I like the brand a lot, um, Volkswagen and Audi. I, I live in the Volkswagen world. Uh, the Audi world's a little above my pay grade, but... Um, you know, it's cool because so many people have Volkswagen-related stories, you know, a ton of people that you meet, you know, their first car was a Rabbit, or, you know, their their mom had an old Beetle, and she loved it, and, you know, it was just a tank of a car, and it was a great car till it caught on fire. My grandparents had a bus when, uh, when my mom and her brothers and sisters were growing up. Um, which is really cool. So there's so much heritage in the brand that I that I really love, and um, you know I think they make great cars. Uh, I know that, <laughs> I know a lot of you guys don't think they make great cars, and and I understand that. But um, I love the brand. I think it's a cool brand. I think the heritage behind it again is really cool. Everybody's got a Volkswagen story, whether it's I hate my POS Volkswagen or you know we've driven Volkswagen since the 60s and uh and that's really cool there's a lot of cool cool stuff around it plus the artwork I don't know if you guys can see this right back here is really neat too so um yeah it's it's a cool brand man I love it um you know professionally was an easy choice and and since then I've I've kind of fallen in love with uh with all the rest of it so uh you know I'm definitely definitely bleed blue at this point in my life uh, he also snuck a second one in there and asked, where do babies come from? And uh, <laughs> uh, I got some snarky comments on it. I guess I'll keep to myself. All right. Landon asks, did, did I forget about him? And the question I asked him, he asked me a while ago, Landon, I did not forget about you. Um, just sorry that it's taken me so long to get back to you. But I got something really cool for you. And uh, basically, just real quick, Landon wanted to know what he needed to do to start a blog and start a YouTube channel. So, uh you know, I'll throw you a little bit of advice here, and that is just just do it. Um, you know, you can figure out the mechanics of it like I did, which was pretty much watching YouTube videos on how to build a blog and how to set it up. Um, as far as filming or uh, or writing, just do it. I know you posted a, a really great video on the blog or on the Facebook page a while back. Just keep doing that, dude. I loved it. Keep rocking and rolling. And he also asked me what I wanted from Santa this year. Um, you know, I don't really need anything this year. You know, it's 14 has been an awesome year for me. So, uh, so uh, I think Santa did a good job for me all throughout the year. And uh, my wife and I are going to be hanging out at home for Christmas. Uh, her father's coming into town. And uh, we'll just be watching movies and uh, taking a couple of days off of the real world, which will be a, a welcome change. So uh, good questions, Landon. And I haven't forgot about you, buddy. Don't worry. All right. Corey asks, what are my thoughts on the rotary engine, and am I a boosted guy or a naturally aspirated guy, and why? Um, rotary's cool. I'm not a huge rotary guy. Uh, it has its place. It's an incredibly cool design. Um, they're finicky as hell, and uh, I'm glad I don't work for Mazda. Um, is really my thoughts on the rotary but I think guys are doing really cool stuff with it uh, my new guys actually really into rotary engines and uh, so I'll probably be picking his brain for a little bit more rotary specifics but uh, he's really into it I think it's cool stuff it's just never really been something I was uh, I'm interested in the technology I just never really got into the uh, the nuts and bolts of it and as far as being boosted or naturally aspirated so am I a turbocharger guy or not um, really both I think they both have awesome applications. My Passat's turbocharged from the factory, which is cool. Um, the cabbie is naturally aspirated for now. Uh, and my wife's truck's naturally aspirated. So, um, you know, I like them all. I think they all have their applications. I think a fully built engine is really, really awesome. And if you were going to ask me to, you know, if I wanted to build a beautiful fully built engine or put a turbo on an engine... Um, money aside, I'd probably do the natural aspirated thing. You know, dollar for horsepower, boost is usually cheaper. Um, 
So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't love either one or one over the other. I think they're both really cool in certain applications. Um, there is something about driving a turbocharged car, though, that, uh, that really puts a smile on your face. My first turbocharged car was my uh, Mitsubishi Eclipse GSX, which, uh, man, what a blast of a car to drive. Um, turbo, all-wheel drive, very, very fun. Um, but I've had some really great times in some uh, normally aspirated cars. Uh, I had an Integra GSR that was moderately modified, but um, moderately modified? That sounded funny. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it all depends on the application. I think they're both cool. You know, driving horsepower, you know, higher horsepower cars is a lot of fun, whether you get it from forced induction or just uh, an all-motor build. But uh, good question. Oh, and thanks for loving the show, dude. I really appreciate that. How often should engine and transmission mounts be replaced, Ramon asked. Um, it all depends. You know, that's a great question because great questions usually have the answer of it all depends. Now, in my Passat, they're hydraulic filled engine mounts. So when I replace them is when the fluid starts leaking. In other cars like A platform, um, by A platform I mean Mark platform, you know, cars, they... Uh, they wear a little bit faster, so it depends on which one and really what you want to accomplish. If you're just looking to keep engine movement down to what it would be from the factory, uh, you know, at 100,000 miles isn't bad. Do you need to? No. Uh, do you need to replace them when you start really getting, you know, the swing back and forth of the engine? Yeah. Um, if you're going to be replacing them with urethane mounts, remember that there will be increased feedback into the cabin of the car from the vibration of the engine. So, you know, as the vibration of the engine comes up, as your car gets older, maybe it is time to go ahead and put new, a new set of mounts in. Um, if you're gonna do them, I recommend doing them one at a time and sort of experiencing the change of doing, you know, the one on the passenger side, the one on the driver's side, and then if there's a, a dog bone mount or a third mount or a fourth mount even, um, do them that way. You know, it's a little bit more work, but it's cool to experience how doing one changes or doesn't change. And, uh, but I don't think there's like an interval or anything like that. Or if you see that they're broken, you know, that's a slam dunk. We had a Passat not long ago that, uh, I don't remember if a bolt broke or wasn't tight or something, but we were trying to find a noise on the lift and all of a sudden, you know, the, the engine's sitting in the car like this and then just goes dunk and dropped about five or six inches. So, uh, that was scary. That's the first time I've ever seen that actually happen on the lift, but, um, you know, again, any any sign of engine vibration, if you can move the engine back and forth more than you think you should, throw mounts on. A lot of times they're really cheap, and uh, and you know, hopefully solve that that problem. But again, if you're going to urethane, remember you're going to get an increase in feedback into the cabin. All right, let's move on here. Bill asked on his '91 18 VW Cabriolet burning oil. Um, he doesn't, he's worried about the valve guides um, or piston rings. So the best way I know to tell whether it's valve guides or piston rings, and honestly, it's probably valve, uh, valve guides or valve seals, um, is to do a compression test. Do a compression test dry and then do a wet compression test. So a wet compression test is when you take a little bit of oil, squirt it into the cylinder, and run the same compression test. If your compression comes up, Odds are it is the piston rings. If your compression doesn't change, you know, you may be looking at something more like valve guides or valve seals. If you're doing either one of those, I would probably do both of those. Um, or just keep putting oil in it, because honestly, that's the best slash cheapest um, repair of all of those. So that's what I would do. Um, it is hard, you know, it's harder to tell. Uh, he doesn't want to put, put the, pull the head and put it back together just to find out its rings. Um, on an engine that age, man, if I was pulling the head off, I'd be ray ringing it too. So uh, if you're going to do one, again, I would do both. Car's only got 145K on it. So I'd probably be leaning more towards the uh, issue with the valves than I would with the rings. Um, and he also asked, after being in service for a while, what's the real reliability of the TDI engine? Are some better than others? Yeah, Bill, you know, there are some that seem to be more reliable than others. I think at this point, um, for those of you that aren't 
very TDI savvy. Basically, we have three TDI engines. We have the ALH, which was early. Um, there are earlier ones than that, but uh, you know the world I deal in is is mostly these three: ALH, which is let's say 2000 Jetta. Um, then you have the Pumpadeuce, which is the next generation, and then you have the Common Rail. The Common Rail is the one that's out today. That's the one that everybody's having issues, you know, everyone, quote, is having issues with um, high pressure fuel pump failures. Um, they all have their issues. Personally, I like the ALH the best. I think it's the most reliable. I think it's the one you can do the most um, with as far as running biodiesel and alternative fuels. Um, the Pumpadeuce is a great engine. It does have issues with camshafts wearing. The Common Rail also has issues with uh, high pressure fuel pumps again, diesel particulate filters. Those are expensive to fix. The, uh, the uh, injectors are crazy expensive. Um, they're crazy expensive on the Pumpadeuce too. Um, the glow plugs are ridiculous. I think like 160 a piece because they have pressure sensors built into them on the Common Rail. So the Common Rail is definitely the most expensive of all of them to maintain. Again, I like the ALH the best. They've been around forever at this point. There's a ton of replacement parts and modified parts for them. Um, a good balance is the Pumpadeuce. It's got a ton more power than uh, the ALH. The Common Rail has even more power, but again, you're dealing with a newer engine that um, has very expensive parts, and uh, you know the parts that have a higher rate of failure are the really expensive ones. So, um, you know, it's all, it, it all depends on what you want to do with it, man. If you want to just jam the key in and go, I'd get an ALH. If you want to modify it, I'd look at an ALH or a Pompadouce. Um, I'm, I'm not ready to pull the trigger on a common rail yet, I don't think. Um, but that's not to say they're not good engines and mostly reliable. But, uh, you know, we'll see what they look like at uh, 300,000 miles. I think the most I've seen on one is like 190. And uh, it, ha it had come in for a, uh, a diesel particulate filter failure. And uh, that's uh, big, big bucks doing that. So, all right. Um, Marissa tagged somebody. And Matt, what's my favorite craft brew? And do I brew my own beer? Um, I love that question, even though it's not a car question. That's okay. Uh I'm a big craft beer guy. I'm actually wearing the sweatshirt of one of my favorite breweries, Haw River Farmhouse Ales. Um, man, what's my favorite beer is uh, is kind of a tough question because I love so many different beers for so many different reasons. Um, I'm definitely a local beer guy, so North Carolina beer is kind of where I, uh, the world I live in for the most part. Um, there's some great stuff coming out of Chicago. I'm from the suburbs of Chicago, so that has also a little bit of sentiment to me too. Um, you know, Carolina Brewing Company, uh, again, Haw River, um, Wicked Weed out of Asheville, North Carolina, all great beers. Uh, I don't want to run down my list because I'll forget somebody and then I'll feel bad. Um, Jade IPA from Foothills is probably one of my top favorites. Um, Haw River did a beer that uh, my wife's on the label. It's actually, I don't know how well you can see that, but it's actually this one right here. You can see that I'm a beer guy with all these stickers back here on the back, Three Floyds. Um, top Notch, Oscar Blues, uh, Great Lakes, awesome beer, Bells makes great stuff, Rogue. So there's a ton of great beers. Usually you guys will see me having a beer while I'm recording or it's, <laughs> if you don't see it, it's like right down here below where the camera is looking. Um, this is a glass that my buddy Chad picked up for me from Devel. Very cool glass. It reminds me of a Minus the Bear uh, video. So I really dig it. Thanks for that, Chad, by the way. Um, I have brewed a few times, but I found that um, there's a lot of really good beer out there, and uh, I would rather drink everyone else's beer than brew my own. So uh, I have the equipment. It's actually parked right above me here on a shelf. We might get back into it one day, but um, you know, I think for the home brewer, at least for me as a home brewer, the, uh, the small one-gallon batches are kind of where it's at. But uh, great question, man. I love talking about beer. Oh, Jeffrey, do I speak air-cooled? Um, I don't. <laughs> uh, I really don't, man. You know, I, uh, I love air-cooled stuff. I think it's ultra-cool, but I can't talk knowledgeably enough about it to, to help you out, man. I'll, uh, what I will do, though, is I'll post this question on Facebook, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get some information from somebody else. Or, uh, you know, if you're an air-cooled expert, fire me an email to charles at humblemechanic.com. 
put uh, you know air cooled in a subject or something, and um, maybe we can uh, do an interview or something and, and try and get an answer to Jeffrey's question. But uh, man, I'm sorry. I wish I could help you. That's just uh, way out of my uh, my skill level. T T and D asks, "What's a service guy or gal's number one pet peeve about car owners?" And there's a response. Uh, James said, "The lo- utter lack of respect for a vehicle. That's part of it." Um, honestly, for me, I try to not put too much thought into all of that. But I will tell you, there's one thing that just it drives me bonkers, and that's. Um, the person that complains how much an oil change is. So most of the time, an oil change at the dealership is like sixty to seventy bucks, depending on your car. Um, so this customer that complains about the oil change price is dressed in North Face apparel, has the newest iPhone, also has an iPad, has cup holders full of Starbucks. Um, their kids all have an iPad and an iPhone. Uh, they're all dressed in REI gear as well. So. Um, you know, I, I struggle with the fact that you're walking around with, you know, $2,000 worth of technology between you and your kids, and uh, you're not willing to spend 75 bucks to maintain the second most expensive thing you buy in your life. But, um, yeah, you know, that's just me. Uh, there's a lot of other gross things. You know, people do gross stuff in their car, and I try not to worry about that. Um, but that one of, of people kind of talking about how expensive stuff is, well, Clearly, they're not worried about how much you know the uh, the fake cold weather gear at REI costs, or the five dollar latte that um, that they walked in with. So, anyway, not a big deal, whatever. But uh, just kind of my my personal pet peeve. Um, Andrew asks, "What's the best designed engine?" Obviously, it's the VR6, right? Um, the history of VW and where do major models get their names? He'd like to hear more about VW history. Andrew, that's awesome, man. I love Volkswagen history. Um, I kind of got off on a little tangent earlier about it. Um, Volkswagen's got such a rich heritage and such like deep roots that sort of spread throughout the automotive industry. It's very cool. Um, their relationship, ups and downs with Porsche and Audi is awesome. Um, probably worth a whole show. Uh, let's see. The Torag, I think, is like a some Indian tribe or something. I don't think I have that one exactly right. But uh, fun fact about the name of the Torag is it was actually going to be called the Colorado uh, before I think it was GM or Chevy brought out their little mini pickup truck. Um, the Tiguan is a mixture of a tiger and an iguana. Um, gosh, there's probably a million of them. I feel like such a tool because I can't remember them right off the top of my head. But uh, we'll do a whole show, Andrew, about Volkswagen history and, and heritage and whatnot because that's a really cool topic, and uh, and I like it, and I like talking about it. So um, good question, man. Uh, but, oh, best design engine? I don't know. They're all pretty cool. Uh, again, the VR, the W is insane um, to, to look at what went into designing and building that engine. So, um you know that's that's cool. I don't really like working on them because they're a pain in the butt. But uh, the W design is cool. The V is cool. Um, you know, there's something to be said just about a well-designed, bulletproof four-cylinder um, in the two-liter non-turbos. So, um, but yeah, I think I think I'm gonna lean on the VR for this one. Um, all right, Victor asks, how difficult would it be for a regular mechanic slash technician? who works at a mom and pop shop to get a job at the dealership starting as a tech. What's a dealership looking for when hiring techs? Victor, this is an awesome question. Man, I love that. And I have a lot of experience um, interviewing technicians and, and hiring technicians and working with new technicians. That's sort of, um, sort of my specialty really in the dealership. Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm training a new guy right now right out of NTI. Um, you know, when it's when it comes to what I'm looking for personally, I'm looking for a really good attitude. Um, I'm looking for someone that is willing to come in and do the work and do what I ask them to do, ask questions, ask me why. Um, I'm looking for someone that doesn't know everything, which is really easy to find because it's everyone. Um, but also recognizes that and doesn't pretend that they know everything. Someone that um, I can rely on, you know, little things like coming in on time, right? That's an easy one. Um, 
someone that I know cares about customers, cares about their cars, really, really puts forth the effort um, to show me that they they want to be here um, and and just you know kick butt at it. I don't think it's a bad thing that you've worked at a mom and pop shop. I think there's a lot of advantages to that that you won't get at a dealership, especially early on. Uh, in my head, a mom and pop shop really, really focuses on their customers and um, and puts them first, which everyone should do. But uh, you know, it's it's a mom and pop shop, right? So it's a family business, and I think family businesses t- typically do a better job. Um, taking care of customers and, and getting to know them. So I think you have a really cool advantage as far as that goes. Um, man, getting in the dealership should be just that easy, though. You know, you have experience working on cars, good attitude. That's number one. Willingness to learn, those are probably the two, uh, the two most important things. And, um, you know, just go in, work hard, kick butt at it learn as much as you can, write things down um, as you're learning and going through, you know, following or shadowing someone, write down everything you can, ask them what, you know, the five most important things you need to know on day one are, that's a really good tip, um, yeah, I'm looking for somebody that doesn't pretend they know everything, honestly, good attitude, and, uh, you know, I said good attitude like four times because I really do think that is, uh, that it's that important. You know, I can, I can teach a lot of people a lot of things about how to fix cars, but, um, it's hard to teach a good attitude. It's hard to teach someone to care about someone else's stuff, um, their car specifically. And, um, uh, it, it's hard to make someone see how important those things are versus, you know, we're techs, right? So we know we have to fix cars. We know we have to do maintenance on cars. We know we have to do those things right. So to get someone to understand that is very, very easy. But to get someone to understand that it's not just about the car, it's about the person behind the wheel, it's about the care of that customer um, is really challenging. And a lot of times guys either get it or they don't. Or it takes them a long time for it to really penetrate their thick skull. So... um just, you know, be awesome, have a good attitude, man. That's really the best advice. You're probably in a lot better position to get a job at a dealership than you might think um, being at a mom and pop shop. You know, it's 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 a good foot in the door at a mom and pop shop. And um, if a dealership doesn't hire you because of that, I think a lot of times it's going to be their loss. Do those things that I mentioned, man. Keep, uh, you know, keep firing me questions and, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. But uh, anyway, guys, I cut that off at <laughs> at 5 Eastern, so that's the last one. Guys, what a great bunch of questions. Post your thoughts in the comments section below, whether it's on the blog or on YouTube. Either one is cool. Um, I had a really good time doing this. This was a lot of fun. This will probably be uh, one of the longest shows that I've recorded, but that's all right. Um, you know, we're winding down the year, so uh, a little bit of extra extra time on a show is definitely fun for me. Um, anyway, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. Don't forget, you can follow me on the blog, on YouTube, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll put links to all that stuff in the show notes. As always, if you have any questions, shoot me an email to charles at humblemechanic.com. And uh, again, let me know your thoughts on this kind of show. If this is something you guys want me to do more often, I loved it, and uh, I hope you guys did too. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.